Story continued from Argentavis episode. It is a hot day over the grasslands of Argentina, and much like the African equivalents of the modern day, they are dominated by large mammals, many of which aren't found anywhere else in the world, such as Diodiaphorus, a horse-like herbivore the size of a sheep, or one of the many relatives of modern armadillos. Some come close to the size of a car. The largest are the ground sloths, and there are over a dozen species coming in all shapes and sizes. With plenty of prey in the open, it's no surprise that predators are often seen as well. Terror birds stalk the land, while various crocodilians patrol the waterways, and above them fly massive birds of prey such as Argentavis, a condor-like hunter with a six-metre wingspan. Within the tall grasses, there is another, much smaller mammalian predator, one from a soon-to-be-extinct order of carnivores. Phylacosmilus may look like a saber-toothed cat, but he is a sporacidont, making him more closely related to marsupials than any placental mammal. His saber teeth and feline-like appearance is due to convergent evolution. As like the various species of cat that have spread across the Northern Hemisphere, he and his kind have evolved to be powerful predators. With short legs, Thylacosmalus is not a fast runner. They rely on ambush to get close to prey and strike without warning. In the open, the tall grasses provide ample cover for a hunter that wouldn't even reach your waist in height. They may be small, but have a stocky and powerful build at 120 kilograms. They are also often found in more marshy locations, as there is plenty of cover there in the thick foliage. Here is where we find an adult male, who has just this morning been chased of a carcass by a descending Argentavis. Brave as he was, very few predators could stand their ground when one of those birds expand their wings to full length. Now in a more forested region, the Phylacosmilus searches for potential prey, but after hours of walking has come up empty-handed, and so when he came upon a small river, approaches to drink. Wading through the shallow water were a flock of Palolotus, distant relatives of modern flamingos. They foraged in the water and at its edge, keeping one eye on the Thylacosmilus. The carnivore ignored the lanky birds and lapped up some water before a splash made him jump back in fright. Out of the river came the long, wide jaws of a Morosuchus. The four-meter-long crocodilian burst out of the surface, clapping its jaws shut. But it wasn't after any mammal or bird. Instead, it had gulped down a mass of small fish with one swipe of its broad jaws. And just as he had revealed himself, he sunk back down into the river, leaving only ripples. Even though it was little threat to the Phylogosmilus, a startled predator had learned to view any crocodilian as dangerous, and so left the area. The marsh was improving an effective or safe hunting ground. Hours pass and the sun begins to set. Striding through the long grass of the plains, the Phylacosmilus passes many glyptodonts and toxodons, all too large for him, too heavily armed or protecting their vulnerable too well. In order to get a better vantage point, the male climbs a tree and looks over his territory. There were herds of Scalabrimatherium, llama-like animals far off in the distance. He was still hungry, but as he lay on the branch, he soon found himself drifting off to sleep. When he awoke, it was night, and he could hear something approaching his tree from below. Careful not to move too much and give away his position, he peered down and saw that a pair of ground sloths were moving near the tree. This species weigh over a ton, too large to bring down, but this was a mother and cub, and the cub was only about twice his size, well within his target range. Shrugging off his tiredness, the male fly like a smilus crept along the branch and as quietly as possible, moved down the trunk of the tree and lightly jumped to the ground. He crunched grass and leaves underfoot as he landed, but the sloths didn't notice. Guided by the sounds of their feeding, he stalked towards them, making sure to track the youngster by sound and smell, 
as he couldn't see through the grass. After a few minutes, he knew that his target was only a meter away. The predator made what could have been considered a blind jump, but his tracking proved spot on and he tackled the juvenile sloth from the side. His forelimbs wrapped around the prey's midsection and the two rolled across the ground. Confused, the sloth tried to stand, but her attacker pulled down hard, pinning her. He then opened his jaws to an extreme angle, fully revealing his massive curved sabers and plunged them down. The Thylaco Smilus did not have the retractable claws of a cat, nor the crushing bite of a hyena. To kill prey, it relied entirely on how it used its teeth. The jewel blades were driven into the sloth's underbelly, cutting through the thick hide and into the soft flesh beneath. As the victim called out to its mother, the Thylaco Smilus pulled his head back, sliding the two teeth across the belly, creating twin lines of red. The mother was close and moved to protect her offspring, so the fire like a smallest didn't stick around. He retracted his canines and leapt off his prey, disappearing into the night. The two sloths reunited, the mother standing over her injured cub, but the predator's bite had sealed the youngster's fate. The wounds he had inflicted were so deep, she would likely die of shock or blood loss, and as she moved in a panic, a small bit of intestine drooped out of one of the open wounds. The pair tried to move away from the area, but staying close behind was the Thylaco Smilus, patiently waiting for the cub to succumb to her injury and for the mother to leave. By the time the sun rises, the Thylaco Smilus has gotten what he wanted. He feeds from the body of his latest kill. Using his canines much like he did last night, he splits the carcass's underside and then sticks out an unusually long tongue to lap up the soft internal organs. These are always eaten first by most predators, especially prized is the liver, but he'll likely gut the carcass before feeding on the flesh and muscle. He has to be quick, the smell of the corpse will attract every scavenger on the ground, and since it's out in the open, every aerial scavenger will see it in broad daylight. In an hour, the site has become a feeding frenzy. Three Thylaco Smilus squabble for the best remaining pieces of the carcass. Around them, smaller mammalian carnivores either wait their turn or try to sneak past the ravenous Thylaco Smilus. Above them, carrion birds circle and descend, while in the distance, small terror birds track the circling birds by sight and zero in on the kill's location. The male Thylaco Smilus watches from a distance. Stomach full, he licks himself clean. Hello fellow travelers and welcome back. Today we will be breaking down South America's saber-toothed predator, Thylaco Smilus. The first remains of Thylaco Smilus were discovered in 1928 by expeditions from the Field Museum in Chicago. The fossils were excavated in the Catamasa province of northern Argentina. Three specimens were sent back to the States, and in 1933, Elmer Riggs, while preparing a full description, named this new genus as Thylacosmilus atrox. The species name meaning cruel, and the genus name meaning knife pouch, referring to the large teeth and the fact that he thought this may be a marsupial or close relative. Stating Thylacosmilus was one of the most unique flesh-eating mammals of all times. He did name a second species at the same time, that being Lentus. However, it was later found to be invalid, so Aatrox is now the only valid species of Thylacosmilus. Other remains have been found since, however, all are fragmentary, making research on the animal quite difficult, but a basic picture of its skeletal anatomy is known. Despite looking like a miniature Smilodon, Thylacosmilus was not a felid. It belonged to an order of mammals called Sporacidonts. This was a group unique to South America that was once thought to belong to marsupials, but is now believed to be outside of them, but still closely related to them nonetheless. They were mostly carnivorous and are now completely extinct. Thylacosmilus's saber teeth and general cat-like appearance are due to convergent evolution as both it and the various saber-toothed cat species lived in separate parts of the world, yet evolved similar physical features, 
likely because they filled a comparable role in their environment. What that role was will be discussed later in the video. It lived from the late Miocene to the Pleistocene, between 10 and 3 million years ago. It grew to about 1.5 metres long, stood about 40 centimetres high at the shoulder, and had a stocky build. Weight has been difficult to calculate, as Thylacosmilus has some strange proportions, with estimates ranging from 40 kilograms to 150 kilograms, though it's averaged out to be between 80 and 120 kilograms making it similar in size to a modern jaguar. Let's take a closer look at the skull, starting with those teeth. The canines evolved into massive, curved sabers that were proportionally longer and thinner than those seen on Smilodon. If we take a look at the inside of the skull, we can see the teeth went deep into the skull going past the orbits and almost over the brain case. See that large bulge on top of the head? Yeah, that's from the teeth. This is because, like rodents, the canines grew throughout the animal's life. This would be very handy, as when modern big cats break their canines, they don't replace, and can severely affect their hunting ability. Whereas if Thylacosmilus broke a tooth, and if it were able to stay alive, it would eventually grow back. The teeth were also self-sharpening. This was achieved by the top canines sliding along the lower canines. So just the action of opening and closing its jaws kept it constantly growing teeth sharp and in shape. The dentary has extended downwards, creating a sort of sheath for the canines. While this may have acted as some sort of protection or stabilization for the teeth, it could also have been to keep the teeth moist, as enamel needs to be kept wet to stay healthy. What sort of soft tissue was covering this area isn't known. It could have been gum tissue, for instance but Thylacosmilus' sabers only had a thin layer of enamel, being 025 mm thick. It should also be noted that having such large intrusive teeth, Thylacosmilus could indeed open its jaws to an insane degree in order to be able to use them at all. Because of the canines going so deep into the skull, Thylacosmilus had limited binocular vision, unlike most modern mammalian carnivores. This may seem to be a hindrance, but a study done in the 2020s showed that despite having a wider field of view, it wouldn't impede it in active hunting, and still had excellent hearing and smell to track prey regardless. While the head was quite large for its body, Phylacosmilus overall was a very stocky animal. The vertebra, for instance, were strongly built, being comparable to that of the Macerodontinae felids, which are the saber-toothed cats. The limbs were short but robust, built for taking heavy impacts and wrestling down prey. The pectoral and deltoid muscles in particular were very powerful. This was an animal built for power, not speed. This is particularly apparent as Thylacosmilus had plantar grade feet. It walked on its palms like a bear or human, and not on its toes like a cat, dog, or most predators. Overall, Thylacosmilus is a bit of an odd predator, with conflicting traits that make it difficult to believe it was indeed an active top-order carnivore, with short legs, non-binocular vision, and having no known incisors. A study done on its bite force showed its jaws were relatively weak, except for when it pulled its head backwards. This has led some to believe that it was in fact a pure scavenger, and would use its massive canines to open up carcasses and get at the internal organs, the gut slurper hypothesis. Now, the idea of extinct large carnivores that only scavenged is one that comes up a fair amount, especially in older studies. But when we look at the world today, the only animals that could be said to be almost exclusive scavengers are specific birds like vultures and condors, as they can fly, allowing them to survey and travel massive distances at great speed and use little energy. To me, it also implies that there is an ecosystem where there is so much carrion that a terrestrial species just lost its ability to hunt over millions of years. When it comes to Thylacosmilus, and other species that don't have the best adaptations for hunting or pursuit predation in particular, the fact is they don't have to be the best to simply survive. Animals aren't characters made in RPGs, they aren't character builds with stats and numbers. So just because they aren't on paper as well adapted to hunt compared to modern animals or even extinct ones, doesn't mean they had to be scavengers. 
Thylacosmilus was also, as far as we know, the largest mammalian carnivore in that area, so it was firmly in the top order carnivore niche. Though, if we're comparing it to other groups, Thylacosmilus' body does have a similar build to the Macarodontinae, the saber toothed cats. So it wasn't just its teeth that evolved convergently. It is also similar to the much more closely related Thylacoleo, the marsupial lion from Australia. All were powerful, muscular carnivores, not built for speed or long chases, and so would have relied on ambush predation. And with more sturdy frames, would have been better equipped to grapple and hold down their prey in order to tire them out and then use their saber teeth to plunge it into a vital area, whether that be the neck, stomach, or rump. There were plenty of slow-moving animals for Phylacosmilus to target as well, from the various notable ungulates, toxodons, glyptodonts, and of course ground sloths, and though some of each of these families would have been far too large for Thylacosmilus, it could still target their young. Speaking of young, it's not known if Thylacosmilus would have nursed and raised its own young in a pouch, like a marsupial, or how many it may have had at a time. There is a theory that it may have had to care for and raise its offspring far longer than what we see in modern marsupials. You see, it would have taken a long time for the canine teeth to get to full size. They definitely weren't born with them. So either the young ate different food from the adults, or the mothers had to raise the young till their teeth grew to the point where they were large enough to use on their preferred prey. Of course, when you see an animal like this, it screams, too specialised. And that may have been the genus's downfall. It was once thought that competition from big cats and other predators arriving from North America was a reason for their extinction. However, Thylacosmilus predates the arrival of saber-toothed cats in South America by about 1.5 million years. So it's more likely a change in their environment and the animals they hunted was the reason for their extinction. In fact, many animal groups were disappearing before the South and North American continent became locked regardless. So, Thylacosmilus, a genus that is so much more than just the marsupial saber tooth. It is another example of how animals don't need to be perfectly built in order to survive, and one of the best cases of convergent evolution, as it lived completely separately from saber tooth cats and wasn't even closely related to them, and yet adapted nearly identical weapons to kill prey. A fascinating animal that shows how strange prehistoric South America was during that time. If you want to learn more about the scavenger slash hunter debate surrounding Thylacosmilus, I recommend Professor Stephen Rowe over at Real Paleontology, who made a much more detailed video on the subject and, unlike me, is a real paleontologist, but, like me, is also Australian. But what do you think of Thylacosmilus? And for my question of the week, are there any prehistoric species that you think genuinely could have been pure scavengers? or scavenge the majority of the time. What lesser known extinct mammal would you like me to do a breakdown on next? And until then, please like, share, subscribe, and thank you for watching.